Tato and greetings. My name is Dubhead. My real name is Patrick Waller. Um, my mum is the only one that calls me Patrick. <laughs> um, a quick bit about me. Uh, I was born in England in 1964. Uh, Scottish mother, English father. Uh, they immigrated to New Zealand in 1969. Um, I've lived here since. I grew up in uh, a very beautiful place by the sea, uh, just out of Auckland, called Maraitai. Uh, in about 1979, I started buying reggae records. Uh, in 1983, I started DJing professionally um, and have been doing so consistently since then. Um, and in 1990, I started doing a radio show on BFM in Auckland, which is the university radio station. And I'm happy to say that that's still going strong now, after 21 years. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about the development of New Zealand's own sound system culture. And uh, I must start by defining sound system culture. Um, a sound system is uh, literally uh, an arrangement of audio equipment. It's a public address system um, consisting amplifiers, wooden speaker boxes, and turntables, basically. A uh, sound system can be very, very small or very, very big, but it's a way to play music that people can hear. Um, as it develops, sound system as a term has also come to incorporate the people involved in running the sound system. So those are the DJs, the MCs, the sound technicians, and the road crew, all the guys that load it in. So as well as being the equipment, a sound system will also denote the crew or the posse that run and operate the sound system as well. Um, for clarity, I'm just going to mention that DJs, uh, for our purposes, DJs are the guys who put the records on, MCs are the guys that chat over the microphone. Uh, originally in Jamaica it was different. The guy on the mic was called the DJ, and the guy who put the record on was called the selector. But it makes it easier if we just use the sort of modern uh, New Zealand expression for those. So uh, MC is the guy who talks, the DJ is the guy who puts the record on. Um, in the world of reggae, or particularly in, in the world of Jamaican music, um, the sound system has been the single most influential driving force behind the music and its, its evolving, changing face. Um, it really is, uh, it, it can't be underestimated the power of the sound system in that uh, initially, because um, Jamaica was a colony, uh, broadcasting in that country was very much based on the British model of public broadcasting. So they didn't play Jamaican music on the radio, not for a very, very long time, not until about the mid-70s. So the way Jamaican people heard Jamaican music was over sound system. They couldn't turn on the radio and hear it. They had to go to sound system. Um, there was another reason too, being a very poor country, uh, it was affordable to go to sound system because these things were set up everywhere. You know, every neighbourhood had sound system. You didn't need a lot of money to attend. It was a way of catching up with your friends, having a drink, having a dance, meet girls, catch up with the gossip, and have a good time. So sound systems quickly became the most popular form of entertainment over there. And of course, we all know that Jamaica had a lot of bands, and they also had a live music scene. But uh, for the poor people, sound system was easier to get to and uh, much more affordable. Um, it's no coincidence that the very first producers of uh, indigenous Jamaican recorded music were sound system owners and operators. So that was uh, Duke Reed, Cox and Dodd, and Prince Buster. All of them owned and operated sound systems for a few years before they decided to actually start recording and producing music. And this was because they knew what people liked. They knew the style of music that people were dancing to. At that time, they were playing um, rhythm and blues records, which they were importing from America. And they could see a gap in the market. And they were like, yep we can do this, we'll get some of our local Jamaican musicians, we'll get them to the studio. And they were the very first people to put records out. Um, and like I said, that's no coincidence, they, they knew their market very well. Um, so they basically started the fledgling, uh, the fledgling Jamaican music industry um, in around about 1959. It was first called uh, Jamaican R&B and then Ska. And each time the music has changed, this has been driven by essentially by dance hall and by sound systems because it's the people and how the people respond to sound systems that has sort of indicated changes. So as it's gone through from ska to rocksteady to then to roots reggae and on through all the other different styles, dub, DJs, MCs, dance hall, into digital and ragga, it has been sound systems that have essentially driven this. Um, 
sound system culture has given us a lot of very uh, modern musical concepts as well because it seems that they were doing these things for a long time before anyone else was. Um, things like MCs, for instance, as they called them in Jamaica, DJs to begin with. MCs. The very first MC was a guy called Count Machuki. Um, and he goes way, way back into the 50s. He was the first guy to ever get up on a sound system and start shouting over the top of the music, you know? And this was something that he sort of picked up from listening to radio, because in Jamaica they could hear radio beaming from the southern states. It was quite close, so on, on, when the weather was fine they could hear it. And uh, he liked the sound of how the, how the American slick DJs on the radio would sort of chat and talk jive talk and that sort of thing. So he started doing that over the top of the records while he was playing. Um, and again, this was in the 1950s, and he was the first guy in Jamaica to do it, but it really caught on. Um, after What's him, that? Camp Machuki. Winston Camp Machuki, yeah. Um, after him, a bunch of guys copied him, and, and, and others came afterwards. Um, Sir Lord Comic and uh, Uroy and so on. But he was the first, and uh, fairly quickly, I mean, it became very popular in Jamaica, so that the DJs had to start talking over the records, and they, you know, they chat up to people that they knew in the crowd, and they tell you about how they were going to play another dance next weekend, and where it was going to be, and all that kind of thing. Um, but Jamaicans invented it, and you know, nowadays we have MCs worldwide, hip hop owes everything for that, because these were the first guys, you know, and they, they rhymed, they told little stories, they, they put messages in there, and uh, so it was sound system that gave us that. Sound system gave us guys rhyming rhythmically over the top of music. Um, another concept that sound systems have given us is uh, the idea of an outdoor rave. I mean, just setting up speaker boxes outdoors and playing music in the open air to the people, you know. Certainly bands have been doing that for centuries, but doing it with speakers, with electronics and everything, and uh, I think, you know, rave, rave culture particularly owes a lot to sound systems because they were doing it from a long time back. Um, dub plates is another one. Uh, initially, when producers would record a band in the studio um, back, in the, back in the 60s there, they would cut a uh, reference disc, one-off acetate reference disc. Um, and this was very good. This is a very useful thing because it allowed the producers to as soon as they'd mix that song, to cut a version of it onto acetate, that night they could take it out to the sound system and they could road test it. They could drop it on there and they could see how the crowd reacted. Now, if the song was a flop, if, it wasn't, if people weren't dancing or they didn't like it, then the producer wouldn't bother going and wasting a whole lot of money and press up 200 copies of it. But if he could see it was going to be a hit, he'd be like, right, oh yes, the people are liking this. So then he'd go and get it pressed because he knew that the people were going to sell it. And, uh, that was a very, very useful tool, as you can imagine, for producers. And uh, once they had recorded songs, they would get them out to as many sound systems as they could, too. So the, the, the practice of cutting what is called dub plates, or acetate, one-off acetates, became very common, because the producer could get his disc to different sound systems, they could start playing them all over the island. It would create a demand for that particular piece of music, and then when the record was actually released, everyone would run to the shops and buy it. So um, it was a very effective marketing tool as well as uh, a good way to sort of road test a particular production to see if it was going to work or not. Um, as things developed, dub plates uh, then became personalised. So people that ran sound systems would go to a producer and ask for a one-off acetate and then they'd get uh, a big name artist <coughs> to voice on top of the acetate and to mention their sound system by name. So that they were then the only person in the world with that particular rhythm, with that person singing on top of it, singing about their sound system. So this became a very effective weapon when it came to sound systems having sound clashes against each other and that sort of thing. And uh, there's a whole culture around dub plates alone, but I won't go into that too much. But basically, it's a it's a one-off acetate cut. So it's not a pressed record; it's a one only, and the vocal that's on it will be unique and singular to the people who paid that guy to sing it. Um, Sound clashes themselves, again, uh, comes directly from, from sound system culture, and that is basically where two sound systems would turn up at the same location as agreed and battle. Um, battling, of course, is, is common in, in every arena, uh, but uh, in sound system culture, particularly interesting, because they would, they would bring their own equipment and they'd face off against each other, and it was usually judged by the crowd. Uh, and the, the response that each sound system got as to who would be the eventual victor. Um, obviously in Jamaica, it was very competitive. There was a lot of sound systems and they were all competing for, for a 
certain amount of dollars and attention from people, so battles would sometimes get quite heated. Man would shoot a bullet through other guys' speaker stack, and you know. <laughs> but um, uh, but essentially, again, that that's a part of sound system culture that has existed since the 1960s. Now, if we look today at say perhaps um, turntablism, the art of hip hop turntablism, or or in fact freestyle battles, that is essentially it's the same thing. It's it's, it's turning a musical form into a competitive sport. You know. Everybody wants to be the best, but um, it's getting up on stage and proving it. So you'll have three or four different turntablists, and they'll have a scratch battle. You know, that goes all the way back to sound systems, and again back to the 60s. Um, I'm not saying it wouldn't have happened without sound system culture. I'm simply pointing out that the Jamaicans were the first to do it, and they did it in the 60s. Um, and also the live DJ mixtape. Another thing that's very common nowadays. Most DJs will create a mixtape and they'll use it as a business card. They'll give it to promoters, to clubs, to whatever, to their fans. Put it on the internet just to say, look, here's, here's my latest tunes and here's me mixing them. Um, in the old days of sound system, uh, particularly the bigger, better known ones, uh, if they were travelling from distance and coming into town to play, people would record it and they'd record it onto tape deck. Um, and those cassettes then became currency and dudes would copy off the cassettes and they'd sell them. Sell them on to other people because you were getting a whole live set so you could hear all the tunes that that sound system was playing. Um, and it was quite a unique thing. And uh, again, I think, you know, some years later DJs were like, no, I didn't know I could record one of my live sets. What a good idea. Um, but yeah, sound system live tapes certainly uh, were there. Um, now, uh, in Jamaica, when they first started doing sound systems, and this was really uh, late 40s, post war, and in the 50s was when um, sound systems first started coming up. Uh, they were quite humble things to begin with, and it was a matter of economic necessity that this equipment was home built because there weren't shops where they could just walk in and buy a huge, powerful amplifier or a state of the art speaker. And quite frankly, the people who wanted to do this didn't have the money either. They couldn't afford to import expensive gear from America. So they adapted and, and economic necessity drove them to build their own speaker cabinets out of plywood or any bits of wood they can find and to home build amplifiers, valve amplifiers and so on. Um, so they were very resourceful. Um, people like King Tubby, it, before King Tubby was known as a producer, he, he was actually an electronics engineer. Um, and he went on to run one of the, the biggest and most powerful sound systems in Jamaica and the fact that his background, uh, as with scientists and Prince Jammy as well, was in electronics engineering. He was handy with a soldering iron, became very valuable. People would go to him and ask him to build them a valve preamp. You know, he used to wind transformers and things like that. So there became a certain technical skill involved in being able to build <coughs> sound systems, build them cheaply, and build them so that they were big and loud. You know. Um, now getting to New Zealand, uh, economics here have actually determined an opposite effect of how it worked in Jamaica, in that uh, as DJs here in New Zealand playing uh, reggae music, most bars and clubs and music venues that you're likely to play in will have their own in-house PA, which is already installed. Uh, when a band or a promoter is putting on a party or a dance outside of that sort of environment, they'll usually find it economically cheaper and better to hire a PA from a sound company, because they're only hiring for one night. It'll be at a fixed cost, and they can pay those costs from what they're getting on the door. And that's a lot cheaper than it is to actually buy or build your own sound system. So in this country,